This is video 5 in this 7 video series on antiarrhythmics. The topic is class 4 drugs, calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers have two distinct subtypes. They are the dihydropyridines, which all contain this chemical structure, and there are the non-dihydropyridines. You may recall that there are two major types of calcium channels, the T-type for transient and L-type for long-lasting. Conventional drugs of both subtypes of calcium channel blockers only have action on the L-type calcium channel. However, only the non-dihydropyridines have antiarrhythmic properties. They act primarily on the conduction in myocardial tissue, exhibiting the slow response action potential. This is the one that is dependent upon calcium current for depolarization and is seen in the sinus and AV nodes. Since depolarization in these cells is dependent upon an inward movement of calcium ions, calcium channel blockers slow the action potential upstroke. As the action potential gets slowed, this results in increasing the time until the next spontaneous depolarization, thus slowing the sinus rate and decreasing the intrinsic automaticity present within the AV node. AV nodal conduction time is also modestly slowed. When I talk about the actions of calcium channel blockers, I'm going to include the non-antiarrhythmic dihydropyridines because their names, classification, and actions all frequently get confused and muddled together. So first, the dihydropyridines. Examples of these drugs include amlodipine, philodipine, nifedipine, and nicardipine. Notice that they all have the same suffix, making it easy to identify them. The hydropyridines decrease systemic vascular resistance through peripheral vasodilation. They have no clinically significant effect on contractility, also known as inotropy, no effect on the sinus node rate, also known as chronotropy, or the AV nodal conduction velocity, which is rarely referred to as dromotropy. And last, they have no clinically significant effect on conduction in the ventricles. When it comes to the antiarrhythmic non-dihydropyridines, there's actually only two to discuss, diltiazem and verapamil. Both of these drugs decrease SVR, decrease contractility, slow the sinus node rate, and slow the AV nodal conduction velocity. Unfortunately, the primary literature is unclear as to their effect on SVR relative to each other and relative to the dihydropyridines, but it's occasionally claimed that the non-dihydropyridines have less of an effect on SVR than the dihydropyridines. This is consistent with how the drugs are commonly used in practice, but I have been unable to find a convincing primary source backing that claim up. When it comes to the effect on conduction within the atria and ventricles, I'm aware of papers in the primary literature which discuss these drugs' effects on the fast response action potential, specifically during phase two, in which an inward calcium current balances with an outward potassium current to create the action potential's plateau. However, I know of no arrhythmia or antiarrhythmic treatment in which an effect of calcium channel blockers on the fast response action potential is relevant. Regarding indications, the dihydropyridines are used predominantly for hypertension. Diltiazem and verapamil can be used for rate control of AFib, aflutter, atrial tachycardia, and rarely multifocal atrial tachycardia. They can also be used for the termination and prevention of AVNRT and AVRT. Once in a while, dilt and verapamil are used for the primary indication of hypertension, but as hinted at before, that's uncommon, and I cannot think of a reason why a physician would choose to do that. As a general observation, use of diltiazem is much more common than verapamil, particularly for rate control of AFib with rapid ventricular response. However, in some situations, there is not a strong pharmacological reason to prefer one over the other. While there are a number of side effects of the dihydropyridines, like constipation and fluid retention, the non-dihydropyridines are well tolerated. The significant side effects of diltiazem and verapamil are entirely predictable. First, both drugs can cause hypotension. This is most commonly a problem 
when treating a patient who already has hypotension in the setting of rapid AFib, in which there is a belief that slowing down the ventricular response by blocking the AV node will improve the blood pressure, but you don't know if the calcium channel blocker's most prominent effect will be vasodilation, decreasing contractility, or increasing AV block. In other words, these are not very clean drugs, so to speak. Also, both drugs can cause sinus bradycardia and AV block, and are thus contraindicated in patients in whom those problems are already present. And there is conflicting data regarding their safety in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, a condition previously called systolic heart failure, but they are generally avoided. That's it for the calcium channel blockers. Video 6 will discuss the last five remaining antiarrhythmics, digoxin, adenosine, ivabradine, atropine, and isoproterenol.